Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Mary. Now, there's a few people just coming in there, so I'll just give them a few seconds to get in and get settled. There's no rush. <laughs> no rush, Josh. Take your time. <clears throat> Excuse my voice this morning. Anyway, you're all very, very welcome here this morning. I'm delighted to see that the weather was beginning to pick up as we were coming across from Manor Clibride. I want to particularly welcome those online and we don't want to forget about them because it's just fantastic that they're there and they're listening in and looking in. I'd also like to welcome anybody who's just visiting here this morning. And we'll just really invite you to stay afterwards for a cup of tea or coffee. And Heather and Les have kindly um, agreed to do that this morning for us. I suppose sometimes, <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. Sometimes when I come into church, you know, our heads are all over the place. My head was in a dream I had last night. And I'm not, <laughs> not giving away any secrets. But uh, Nikki and I were out for a walk yesterday and we were on a very, very narrow road and a car came around the corner and he was just really going too fast. But he missed me, thankfully. And he didn't get Nicky either, which is a relief. <laughs> <laughs> but I had a dream then last night that I was driving a little electric car. And I was going along the road in this little electric car and everything was going fine because it, I didn't have to think about it. And suddenly a bunch of people appeared in front of me and the car was going straight for them. And I didn't know where the brake was. And I said, I remember saying to myself, why didn't I ask somebody where the brake is? So that was going through my head this morning. And you know when, I, I don't know what, I, I woke up. Okay, just to, so you're not all worried. I woke up at that stage. But you know when there's stuff in your head? 
So that was in my head coming in this morning. And I just wonder what's in your head as you come in here this morning. What's going on? You know, what, what are you thinking? What do we do for lunch? What do we do for dinner? I have shopping to do. I have cleaning to do. I have to catch up with somebody. I have phone calls to make. Um, I'm coming in. I have fear in my heart. I have anxiety. I don't feel well. I'm just not myself. I'm lonely. I'm having disagreements with people. I'm a little bit unsettled. And I suppose what we really would like to welcome you to do today is just as you come into God's presence here, that we just really relax and, and if possible, just empty your minds of all those thoughts and come into his presence and really focus on the Lord. And thankfully, we have Libby and Louise here that will help us with worship this morning. But really to sit back and worship the Lord with all our hearts, to focus on him and not ourselves. So, um, unfortunately, Richard is not here today and can't be here, but I'd like to uh, give a special welcome to Phil this morning. And Phil has very kindly offered to share God's word with us and share about God's love for us. And we ask you, Lord, just to bless Phil as he comes later on to speak to us. We know him very well from years gone by when, as I said to him before, when he's a little fellow running around here and his parents... And he's a member of Maynooth Community um, Church. But I really welcome you here today, Phil. And um, I ask you, Lord Jesus, to speak through your words and that we would focus on you, Lord, and worship you during this service. Thanks, Phil. It is so good to be with all of you. And I, again, thank Richard, wherever he might be, somewhere in England, I believe. Um, I believe. Uh, for extending the offer. Um, welcome to worship. It is good to be gathered to worship the Lord our God this morning. So I would invite you as we begin our worship for you to stand and read these words that are our call to worship. I'm going to read the parts that are marked leader, and then if you want to respond with the words that are marked all. In your wisdom, O God, you call us here to worship you. We gather alive to the word of God. You call us to be fully alive with your life abundant, ready to listen and respond with heart, soul, strength, and mind. We listen alive to the word of God. You call us to be always watchful for your word of wisdom, sometimes startling and unexpected, sometimes still and quiet, but always dwelling among us. We watch and wait for the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm going to invite Louise and Libby to lead us in our first song, which is going to be Over All the Earth. singing, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, to my heart to sing Thy grace, streams of mercy never ceasing, go 
And let us continue in our worship in a posture of prayer. So let us pray together. Loving God, we have gathered to meet you. We have come to listen to you, to seek you, to worship you. You are the beginning of all things, the life of all things. You knew us before we were born. In you we become, in you we live. Loving God, you are here and everywhere, around us and within us. You know our innermost thoughts. In you we hope, in you we live. You are the source of serenity, giving peace that is beyond our understanding. In you we are still, in you we live. Loving God, we live in you. We worship you. Loving God, you live in us. We worship you. Holy and merciful God, in your presence we confess our sinfulness and our shortcomings and our offenses against you. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, in forgetting your love. Have mercy on us, O Lord, for we are ashamed and sorry for all we have done to displease you. Forgive our sins and help us to live in your light and walk in your ways for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And together we pray. Amen. Friends, hear now these words spoken to and over you. Through Jesus Christ, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. In Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Beloved, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia and amen. In a moment and continuing our worship of acknowledging the joy of gathering to worship God, hear these words now from Psalm 76. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us, that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among the nations. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you rule the peoples justly and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, O oh God. May all the peoples praise you. And the land will yield its harvest 
And God, our God, will bless us. God will bless us, and all the ends of the earth will fear him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm going to invite you to stand as we continue singing with the help of Louise and Levy, song Faithful One. Please stand. from me later on in the service, but I'm going to invite, I'm really looking forward to this, I'm going to invite Dave to come and share for the kids. So Dave, come on up. Was it Leslie Crowther used to say, come on down? Well, I was asked to come on up. I have to put the hat on. This is where the stories come from. <laughs> okay. Ah, yeah. This is a story about a little bird. I know people like stories about little birds. And this little bird is called a skylark. Now, when the earth was first created and everything was well, before Adam and Eve had eaten of the forbidden fruit, the skylarks, they loved singing. They will soar up into the sky and sing their heart out. But when Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, everything changed. The birds, they were their friends, like the sparrow hawks, started hunting them and eating them. So they decided, from then on, they're never, ever going to sing again. Then, thousands of years later, Jesus Christ came. 
And you know, he used to walk up into the mountains or out into the fields, and he talked with his heavenly father. When he did, birds would come along and sit on his shoulders, and the animals would walk beside him because they weren't afraid of him because they knew he was the one who created them. But he especially loved the little skylark. And the skylarks used to come and sit on his hand. And he'd say, my little friends, he said, one day you're going to sing again and you'll have a reason to sing and it won't be long now. And they waited. But then a horrible thing happened. Jesus died. And the starlings, and that's not the starlings, the skylarks were wondering, what is this thing we're going to sing about? Jesus is dead. Our friend, he's gone and he's dead. Then, three days later after Jesus died, on a Sunday morning, some women were walking toward the tomb and they heard this sound. And they looked up in the sky. Right up in the sky. And they're soaring up in the sky. It was the skylarks. They were back singing again. Oh, isn't that brilliant? Skylarks sing again. And do you know... I think the Skylark's going to stop now. Do you know? (laughs) Thanks, Colin. (laughs) Do you know that um, we've got a reason to sing? Because Jesus is alive. None of us would be here today if Jesus had died. There'd be hardly anything. There'd be things written about him. Maybe people would follow him in some sort of a way, but you and I wouldn't be here. And it's because Jesus died. And one of the things, he died, he rose again, and he ascended to his Father. And he gave us the Holy Spirit. There's, let me tell you about two things I'd like to say. One is, when you become a Christian, You become a brand new person inside. And you'll never be the same again. Everything will change. That's because Jesus rose from the dead. And I just want to read you something. Something else is going to happen. I don't know how long it's going to be. We never know. When Paul's alive, he thought this was going to happen pretty soon. 2,000 years have passed. But let me read this to you. It's amazing. I will explain a mystery to you. Not any, every one of us will die. That's good news, isn't it? But we will all be changed. It will happen suddenly quicker than the blink of an eye. At the sound of the last trumpet, the dead will be raised and we will all be changed so that we will never die again. Our dead and decaying bodies will be changed into bodies that won't die or decay. The bodies we now have are weak and can die, but they will be changed into bodies that are eternal. Look, some of you might be quite happy in the body you have now. But I'm going to tell you this. When you get a new body from him, I'm hoping that all of us will be here when Jesus comes back. So I won't have to die. None of us will have to die. But you might be happy in the body you have. But I'm going to tell you this. The body that he's going to give us is going to be like nothing else we even dreamed of. It's going to be simply amazing. And it is all because Jesus died and he rose again from the earth and he lives victorious. And he lives in every person who believes in Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. 
I always love Dave's stories. Thank you, Dave. And before we continue on with our service for the kids, have to do something for the kids, have to do, have to do a song. So Louise and Libby, Libby, do you know your actions? I mean, kind of. I could definitely use some help. Okay, well, I'll, I'll try my best. Okay. Can I guarantee? Let's do it together. Okay, <laughs> great. So if you like to stand, we're going to sing together. Our God's a great big God. Make sure you do holy actions if you know them. And Mary is going to come and lead us in our announcements and our prayers for others. Amen to that. How great is our God is a great big God. And if we go out just th remembering nothing else today, that's, that'd be great. So I have a couple of announcements. I have three announcements, actually. And the first one is, we are having the most exciting day here in the church next Saturday. And, and Paul and Nikki and the others on the committee will verif verify this. And Louise, this is probably one of the highlights of the year. Guess what? It's a clean-up day. No, no. So the first thing I said to myself, oh, it's amazing, Nikki. I'm really busy next Saturday. <laughs> because... I don't like cleaning, and never mind cleaning the church, I avoid cleaning at home. Nikki does all that, which is great. Anyway, I want to encourage you to come along next week, and I am hoping to come along just in case you think I'm going to skive off. Um, so that, <coughs> excuse me, the plan is that there's a cleaning time between 10 and 3 p.m. Um, now, it seems like a very long time, but what Richard and the committee were feeling was that it's better to give people options so that, you know, if Richie can't come at 10, he might just come in at 11. And um, let me see, <laughs> who else can I spot check down here? <laughs> Heather. No, we'll, we'll talk about Heather later, you know. Um, but Janet there. Jan now, by the way, it's not just because you're one of, you're like myself, a bit older, Janet, but if... If you have a bad back, do come along, because we've lots of work just at height, as you know, at eye level, so we won't put you under strain. But this is really an opportunity to have fellowship as well, and, <clears throat> and I hope that somebody in the committee will bring some music, because the last time our daughter was back from London, she put on some of ABBA or something just to get us to try and clean up a little bit, and it worked. So maybe some of the committee would have some music and blare it and help us all to do a few jobs. And Paul, thankfully, has pages long of work to do. So the idea is, please don't just say no straight away inside those heads of yours. Just actually start saying yes and come along, have a little bit of fun and um, bring your cleaning agents, your buckets, your hoovers, your sif, your jif, your vanish, 
whatever it is that you use, bring it along, because there will be some cleaning agents, but probably not enough. But please do. Um, we'd be delighted to see you. So one of the highlights of this actually um, has just come to my mind there a little while earlier. I had in my notes here, maybe somebody would make a cup of tea during the morning just to kind of give people a little refreshment. But coming in, Heather said, oh, Mary, just to say, I'd love to do lunch for people. Yay, next Saturday. So Heather has offered to do soup and sandwiches or whatever, and that's, that's fantastic, which means that if you come in the morning time, you'll get a lovely lunch. But if you come after lunch, you'll miss the lunch. But wouldn't it be great if we could get everything done by maybe one half one? So there's a challenge. Thank you very much, Heather, for that word this morning. The second announcement is, this is about clowns for Haiti. And now most of us know or knew Brian Beersley in the church. And every time I just think of Brian, I actually feel quite sad. Um, it's actually a shock to think that he passed away on the 30th of December last. But Brian was involved with the Clowns for Katie, a Dublin-based charity, and working to rebuild and resource schools in Haiti. That was six since the 2010 earthquake. And more, and more recently, last year, there was another earthquake. So the fundraising that will be held is really to support these children in Haiti. It's going to be held in St. Catherine's Church in Thomas Street. And it's next Friday, the 27th of May, at, at a quarter to seven. And it, it will be an amazing event. Tickets are available on Eventbrite. <coughs> Eventbrite. <coughs> Excuse me. And it will really be a fantastic, entertaining evening with performances by various artists from around the world. And there'll be a special trumpet uh, tribute to Brian as well. So again, we encourage you to go to support this charity, if at all you're, you're free. Next Friday, the 27th of May, a quarter to seven in St. Catherine's Church in Thomas Street. The last announcement is that there's a prayer and praise time. It will be held on next Sunday week, which is the 5th of June. And the 3rd of June was mentioned, but now it just please note it's the 5th of June. Um, at 7 p.m. And this will be led by Richard. So again, we'd encourage you to come along to that, please. So we're going to go into a prayer time now. And I have a number of things, a number of points that I want to pray about. Um, so if you just bear with me, but we just ask you, Lord, that we come into your presence at this time. We thank you for being here. We just bring, bring the prayers of our hearts up to you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your great love for us. Thank you that you hear the cry of our hearts. We praise you for your creation, for the sea, the sun, the stars, the moon. At times we cannot fathom the beauty of this world. We are in awe of this universe. When we stop to consider the lilies of the fields, how they grow, they do not labor, they do not spin, they just are. They do not put work and effort, yet they blossom at the right time and bring such color, vibrancy, beauty, and joy to us all. Help us, Lord, to be like the lilies. Instead of working hard to work things out, lose sleep and worrying, and during these times of trouble, help us to rest in you. As the bulb sits steady and sturdy under the ground, until you say it's time to bloom, so we will sit sturdy and ready to bloom again at the right time. You know what we need before we ask. Help us to rest in you and seek your will and timing in our lives for all our concerns. He is my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. We can trust in God's care. Jesus did not neglect to acknowledge the difficulty of life. He knows our tendency to panic and to worry. 
I've told you these things so that in you, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. I have overcome the world. <coughs> Excuse me. I lift before you Ukraine again, Lord, Lord, and other countries at war. What can we say? How do we even try to understand man's inhumanity to man? Father, we know that this struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Let us choose to pray and to pray again and to pray again and to never give up. We pray for healing of a traumatized people. We pray that your Holy Spirit move and cause a lasting peace in Ukraine. For those in our congregation and for those close to us, Lord, those who are recovering from surgery, those who feel ill, who are suffering from depression, anxiety, for those in deep pain and close relationships, those who are unhappy in school, in college, in their workplaces, for those who are praying for their sick children and grandchildren, we lift all the heartaches of your people to you. Let us remember the Lord has promised that he will rescue us. He will protect us as we acknowledge his name. We will call to him and he will answer. He will be with us in trouble. He cares for us. Another prayer I'd like to lift to you, Lord, is Richard mentioned a partnership exploration that's happening between the board of Lucan Centre and 24-7 prayer movement in Ireland. I would like to lift this project to you, Lord, today. We pray now and ask you, Father, that you be the centre of this time of exploration, that you reveal your will through the Holy Spirit, that your Holy Spirit moves within these people who are having these discussions, that they're just not having discussions one with other, but that you're settling in the centre of it all, Lord. We are excited for the opportunity, and any, any opportunity we see, for an ongoing prayer presence in this community and in every community in Ireland. We ask you just to bless this, these talks and let them fulfill the vision of this unique centre that was seeded by Trevor so many years ago. We desire, Lord, to see more people come to know you in this community and with, in our, with our neighbours and our family members. We long, Lord, for them to know you. We are in a, <coughs> excuse me, such a secular world <coughs> where people don't seem to need you, Lord. People feel they're in control, but we're not in control. So, Lord, with this partnership, over these weeks and months, we pray that you prepare the ground to bring this to fruition in order that your people will turn and praise you and proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. I'd like to just spend a moment now bring your personal needs to the Lord. If you make the Most High your dwelling, even the Lord who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Nothing will separate us from God's purpose in us. Thank you for your word. Amen. Thank you, Mary. And I believe we need to take up an offering as well. So um, as you feel so led, I don't know who is responsible for that. That's great. Nikki, great. Off we go. So take a few minutes to take up the offering.
Amen. If you have a pew Bible with you, or if you have a Bible in your bag or on your phone, please turn to Acts chapter 1, which if you do have a pew Bible, it's on page 1092. And our reading this morning is going to be from Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. So I'll give you another few seconds to get there. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Hear now the word of the Lord. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back again in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Beloved, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And before I come to speak, I'd love to, for you all to share and pass the peace to one another. So just turn to one of your neighbors, say hello as I get myself situated and set up. Join me now, then, in a word of prayer. Blessed are you, Lord God, King of all creation. May you teach us by your word. Open our hearts to your spirit, and lead us on the paths of Christ, your Son. All praise and glory be yours forever. Amen. I suspect that if I ask most of you where you were on September the 3rd, 2017, at approximately 4 a.m. early in the morning, most of you would quite rightly say that you were fast asleep in bed. That was not the case for me. And nor was it the case for my parents. Because that was the day that I would get on an airplane and travel to a very strange land called the United States of America, more specifically Southern California. And that's where I would begin my theological training, my studies at Fuller Seminary. And because it was the day that I would fly to my new home, it was the day that I said goodbye to my friends, my home, my family, my parents. This was a very hard goodbye. I'm sure that my mom and dad, if they were here, could attest to that. It was a good goodbye, and I'm sure they could also attest to that, but it was also hard. I suspect most goodbyes that we ever go through, that we are ever acknowledge, are somehow hard. As much as it may be the right or proper thing to do, there is a certain sense in which saying farewell to someone 
or something means a change in the way we live our lives. Saying goodbye is, in other words, so hard because nothing in our lives will ever quite be the same as if we had never said goodbye. It would be too easy to suggest that our text this morning, what many around the world call Jesus' ascension, is simply a story about saying goodbye. That is what it is, in part. But as we read this story, we find that those gathered to say goodbye to Jesus, well, they're not hard done by. They're not sad. They are instead filled with a kind of wonder and awe. How could this possibly be? How could saying goodbye to their Lord and Master not be one of the most crushing moments in their lives? Well, that's what we want to look at today, this morning. And given that the early church in places like the Apostles and the Nicene Creed think it's so important to include in the foundational statements of what it means to be a Christian, to include the fact that Jesus ascended to heaven, this is something we should keenly want to examine. So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to keep them open, whether you have a real physical one or you've got one on your phone, whatever it might be the case. And turn to verse 1 with me. And notice right from the get-go, the author of Acts is continuing his thought from an earlier text. Indeed, the author of Acts is the same author of the Gospel of Luke such that if we want to truly understand what's going on in Acts, not just in our passage today, but throughout the rest of the book, we need to pay careful attention to this third gospel. Now, I'm going to do something that I would never encourage doing, and that is trying to simplify an entire book of the New Testament into a single sentence. I'm about to break my own rule. But at the risk of oversimplifying this gospel, what I want to suggest is that Luke, in his gospel account of Jesus' life and death and resurrection, is eminently concerned with Jesus as ruler and embodiment of God's kingdom, best demonstrated in the work of the cross and the empty tomb. This is at least partially what Luke has in mind when he is writing to Theophilus. And you might think of Theophilus as a benefactor, someone who wants to know about Jesus and has commissioned Luke to write this account for him. This, the first volume of Luke's work explored all that Jesus did. Of course, Jesus did much more than hang on a cross and rise from an empty tomb. And moreover, Luke is also attesting to what Jesus taught as equally important for his account to Theophilus. But friends, remember, as we are gathered here today, we are still celebrating Easter. We are still in the time that bears witness to and celebrates the good news of Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. So it's not that Jesus' words and miracles and life have no significance. It is instead to understand that, as one of my favorite authors puts it, that Jesus saw in his cross the summary of his whole life. Any goodbye that we might say doesn't just appear out of nowhere. When I said goodbye to my parents on September the 3rd, 2017, it carried with it 25 years worth of stories and memories and lives and experiences. And likewise, I want to suggest that we can only understand the significance of Jesus' ascension by remembering the totality of the gospel. That is the life of this God-man, this Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But now look at verse 2. And notice that Luke has a clear demarcation between his two books. The former, what we call Luke's Gospel, talks about everything that happened up until the day that Jesus ascended. So presumably, what we're reading now, the book of Acts, is going to follow on from that. And it's in this verse that as readers, we meet for the first time the character of the Holy Spirit. 
arguably the main character, the protagonist throughout the entirety of the book of Acts. In our passage today, we get no fewer than three mentions of this Holy Spirit. So whatever Jesus' ascension might mean, we can think of it separate from the presence and character of this Holy Spirit. And so Luke will continue to explain what we might call the context for the ascension in verses 3 and 4. He describes, for example, how Jesus appeared to his disciples alive after his suffering. Of course, Luke, we might think Jesus presented himself alive to the disciples. We all know this story. What an obvious thing to say. But let us not forget that it's not quite so obvious that nothing is quite so obvious, especially a dead Galilean itinerant preacher coming back to life after public execution. As much as possible, and however familiar we are with these stories, we would be wise to hold in mind the awe of such an awesome presence, and that presence being this Jesus risen to new life. And in this new life, Jesus continues, in Luke's mind, to speak and teach about God's kingdom. Death and the resurrection do not change the focus of Jesus' life and ministry. If they do anything, they make that all the more real and possible. And in verse 4, we find Jesus speaking for the first time in the book of Acts. We know Jesus. We've read all the gospel accounts. We might expect him to start teaching his disciples about the way of the kingdom or to tell a parable, maybe to rebuke a religious authority or two. But what Jesus does here in verse 4 is he offers a command. Jesus commands his disciples to stay in Jerusalem. Now, this stands seemingly in stark contrast with the Jesus who would direct his followers in, say, Matthew 28, the Great Commission, to go and make disciples of all nations. Yet the stay in Jerusalem is not an indefinite one. Jesus makes it quite plain that the purpose of waiting in the home of their religious world is so that the disciples might receive the promise of the Father. And what is that promise? It is nothing short of a new baptism. Whereas John inaugurated people into the kingdom through the waters of the Jordan, the disciples on this side of the resurrection will find themselves immersed in the presence of the Holy Spirit. I kind of feel like I want to say, amen, Lucan. But I'd be not a very good Presbyterian if I did that. Jesus' suffering, the kingdom of God, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If we think of the word ascension, how many of us would name these points, those three points, as connected to the rising of our Lord into the new heavens? Not many. I suspect I certainly wouldn't have. But this is precisely the context from which Luke will draw our attention to the ascending Lord. We won't ever fully comprehend what the ascension means unless we understand the full history from which it emerges. And that history, that story, is nothing short of the life and reign of God in Jesus Christ. So if verses 1 through 5 give the context for the ascension, the second half, beginning in verse 6, the second half of our passage walks us through the event proper. So turn with me there. And even before we arrive at the main course, we're treated to an appetizer. One last dialogue between Jesus and his disciples in his earthly life. And that's a moment of contestation. For the disciples think, ah, this is, this is perfect. This is the opportunity. This is the moment that they now ask if this is the time when Jesus will restore the kingdom to Israel. 
For many, this might seem like a logical move. Jesus has been declared the Messiah, the Christ, God's anointed one, who has now overcome death and risen to new life. If there is anyone to restore the kingdom of Israel, to bring it back to its former glory, surely it must be this Jesus. The problem, of course, is that this kind of question, it forgets the kind of Messiah that Jesus is. The disciples still see Jesus as the Messiah who will rule with great power. And indeed, let me make it clear, Jesus does and will rule with great power. But it is a power not born from sheer might or strength. It is a power encapsulated in the image of a slain lamb, a good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. It is an image not just of the kingdom restored to Israel, but the ruler of God's kingdom breaking into the whole world. And some people throughout the world, on hearing this kind of remark, and indeed hearing Jesus' words, not just a verse later, well, they can't stand that. They think Jesus must be wrong. And so they will try to restore the kingdom for themselves by whatever means necessary. They will take up swords and spears. They will collect intelligence and supplies. They will march to cities like Baghdad, like Kiev, like Mariupol, even to the holy city of Jerusalem itself, and attempt to bring the kingdom about by a force unbecoming of God's new rule. They lack a patience to see the way of God in the world. And this is exactly what Jesus tells his disciples in verse 7. The disciples do not know, nor are they to know, the times and sequences of events that the Father has set down by his own authority. Much as we might like Lucan, we do not know when Jesus will restore the kingdom, much less the twists and turns of our own lives, whether that be as individuals or as a gathered body. Our job is to wait. Our waiting, however, does not mean an idle or passive acceptance of the world and its circumstances. Instead, it's to be what Jesus calls his disciples to in verse 8 to be witnesses. We are to be witnesses of the same Jesus who suffered for the sake of the world. And we witness to this Jesus not by our own strength and might, but as Jesus says, by the gift of the Holy Spirit. And what's more, Jesus tells us exactly where the disciples are to be witnesses. And we can see this kind of movement outward in a sort of like a concentric circle fashion. The disciples are to be Jesus' witness in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. It's easy to see this as a metaphor or an analogy for our own lives. We might suggest that Jesus asks us in a kind of like-minded fashion to witness to our family, and maybe then to our relatives, and finally to the rest of our peers and friends. But part of the gospel's power, part of the gospel of Jesus Christ's power is that it is deeply political, not partisan. Let me make that really clear. Not partisan, as in the current formation of democratic governments around the world, but political in the basic sense that it is all about the relations and connections between people, between you and I and everyone gathered in this room and everyone outside of these four walls. And I'm not saying that we should not be witnesses to Jesus, to our friends and family. I want to say... Amen. 
please go and do likewise. But what Jesus is prompting us to and what he's pushing the disciples to here in this passage is to witness to the city, to the community that we belong to, to the locale or the country or the nation, the space in which all of our communities belong, and then to the wider world where all of those gathered communities, those countries, those nations work together. If this is a little bit hard to imagine, and no surprises there, it's me talking, let me try and give you an example and sort of prompt towards an application for this community here. Think about, for example, Lucan, the development plans for the rearranging of traffic and parking in this little community here. Now, without me giving away my own perspective on the matter, the question that I think this passage and that Jesus wants us to push us towards is how might we, as a community, as a community of faith, as a community of faith that believes in the Lord Jesus, how might we bear witness to the God of Easter in response to this real and tangible concern for the village of Lucan? That, I want to suggest, is where we're called to be witness. It's interesting, is it not, that just as Jesus calls his disciples to be witnesses, so then do they witness the ascension. This is in verse 9. We have finally reached our destination. Phil has finally gotten to the point of the sermon. He introduced it right at the very top that this was going to be a talk about the ascending Lord, and we're finally here. This is the moment our text has been seemingly building to all along. The disciples, and now we as readers, we witness Jesus ascending into the heavens where he now sits at the right hand of the Father ready to judge the living and the dead. And that's about it. We're not actually really told all that much more about the ascension. We're not given a protracted description. There's no song and dance. All that we're told is that Jesus was lifted up and then a cloud took him out of the sight of the disciples. That's about as much of a goodbye as we get in this passage. Except we know it's not really a goodbye. Sure, the disciples stand amazed at the mystery of this event, but no sooner had Jesus disappeared from their physical, tangible, material presence did the comfort of angels assure them that Jesus would return again to earth in the exact same way. Ascension, then, is not just about something that happened in the past. Ascension for us today, gathered here today, Lucan, is a reminder that Jesus will one day return. Ascension gives us a glimpse, albeit through a dimly lit mirror, of the future return of Jesus, a return where we expect him to restore the kingdom, but he will restore it according to his time. And it will not just be the kingdom of Israel, but indeed God's whole kingdom, inviting all who will participate and come. But there's another reason why this ascension isn't a goodbye as well. That's the twist. This isn't a goodbye. My departure to live in Los Angeles might bear some resemblance to Jesus' ascension in the fact that we both went vertically for a little bit, but in many ways it actually falls far short and the reason for that, the reason the ascension isn't really a goodbye is because, as Dave so eloquently put for the kids, Jesus is still present. For in just a few short verses from this passage, and for many Christians around the world, in a few short weeks, we're going to celebrate Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and what many will call the birth of the Christian church. And if we believe the New Testament at all, we believe that this church, by the power of the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Father, is Christ's own body. 
the Holy Spirit takes the presence of Jesus and casts it wide out into the whole world such that Jesus continues to abide with us. And the Holy Spirit comes on the heels of this ascension. We might say then that rather than a goodbye, the ascension is a welcome. It's a welcome, a welcoming of Jesus' presence into the whole of the world and specifically into the creation of a new people called church. This is us, Lucan. We are a part of this. In the ascension, Jesus brings into view his own presence such that there exists now no distance between God and us. We are indeed the body of Christ. As we move to a close, let me remind you that we are only this body by the power of the Holy Spirit. Our life in this church is not meant to be about remembering a goodbye. It is to remember a welcome. A welcome of the new way God would preside in the world. And the way God would preside is to ascend and pour out His Spirit. The gift of the Spirit does not mean we simply just become something, but that in becoming something, and that something being church, we are called to do something. And that something is witness. We are called to witness in our lives and in our gathering together to the one who dies the death of shame and rises to the new life of glory. This is the way God will rule. And we are called to witness to it. So Luke, and may we remember this ascension. May we remember that this ascension follows the story of the great Lord of Easter who suffered on the cross. May we behold that this ascension inextricably ties us to the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who empowers us to be the church. And may we bear witness to the truth of this great welcome that God still resides in us and will one day come again. Let us pray together. Risen and ascended Christ, you surround us with witnesses and send us the counselor who opens our minds to understand your teaching. Bless us with such grace that our lives may become a blessing for the world now and in the age to come. Amen. As we move towards the close of our worship, I'm going to invite Libby to come on up. And we are going to stand together once more and sing the, the lines of this great song. Thank you for the cross. Amen.
for the price you paid. Bearing all my sin and shame, in love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for this love, Lord. Thank you for the nail pierced hands. Wash me in your cleansing flow. Now all I know. Thank you so much for worshiping with us, whether you've joined in person or online. If you're able and you're in person, please do stay around for a cup of tea and coffee and some fellowship afterwards. And let us now say the words of the benediction. We'll just read the words that are marked all. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.